about the fans this morning, but look at here. Did y'all get one of these? Yes. Oh, man, thank you so much. These are wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Man, I'm telling you, we got a lot to be thankful for if you just stop long enough Amen. and give it some thought. I mean, we really do. There you go. There you go. Woo, this may get, we may get full gospel up in here before it's all done. Uh, I'm going to need it. I'm going to tell you guys, there, there are times when you pray and you open the Lord's Word up and man, it just, the Holy Spirit just floods you. It's like I don't have enough ink in my printer or in, the, in my pen to get it all out. And then there are times where it's just like, <coughs> nothing. Crickets. And uh, and I'll be honest with you, as we're going to start uh, in the book of James in chapter 5, it, I came across that scenario. And I, I read my commentaries. I think I'm up to about 8 right now. Uh, various commentaries on uh, from the early church fathers all the way to modern times. And even there, all of them had great insight, great information, great lessons to glean from these verses. Yet, the Holy Spirit was like, almost like Paul. He said, I'm going to go to Bithynia, or I'm going to go to Asia. And the Holy Spirit said, no, sir, I don't think you are. i got somewhere for you to go. And, uh, and he, was, he was faithful with it. And when he got to the coastline, he had that Macedonian call. You know, and uh, and because of that, Europe received the gospel message. So um, I pray that the Holy Spirit takes this. I've got some notes, but uh, they're they're I don't know. I don't know about how I would present it. They're they're not. I don't want to say it. They're not fiery. You know. They're just, they just are what they are. And maybe that's that maybe that's the Holy Spirit's point altogether. So we're going to lean heavily in, into Him and thank God for the comfort. Uh, I don't know how I do or handle days like today outside of Him. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to, it's a little bit different. We're going to read God's Word and then we're going to open in prayer. Starting in chapter 5, verse 1 of the book of James, it says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped, treasure in the la heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. So we pray. Father God, we do thank you for your word. The parts that we can easily comprehend and we can wrap our lives around and model in our lives. And Lord, we thank you for the more complicated verses. Even though that we can understand the sentiment, we each and every one of us are in different financial categories this day. And Lord, so this verse can't be just structured to one group or a single individual. We have to take it as your Holy Spirit delivers it. And Lord, it's in that Holy Spirit in which we cry out today, Lord, that He speak the truth of this Word presented before us. And Lord, that He also helps our spirits receive. And these things we ask in the name of Christ Jesus and give thanks in advance. Amen. Amen. So, as we look at this, remember we talked, I think it was last week, where we said these, these chapter divisions don't necessarily fall right where they should, so to speak. Most of the time, I would say yes, but there are a few occasions where they really don't. And uh, I think we alluded to that last week. In honesty, we would need to pick this back up, our study today, in starting chapter 5 by going back to verse 13 of chapter 4, because they're one and the same. And they're, 
they are delivered to a specific people group in this day and age in the first century church here. And you can tell though that linkage from how both of those uh, portions start. They both say, state, come now. Isn't it just like, if you can think back to when you were a little kid, and you're playing with your friends, and if you're one of the guys, y'all are probably, you know, playing baseball or football or something like that with a neighborhood group, and you're in the middle of the game, you don't want to tear away. So when mama comes out on the front porch and says, dinner's ready, instead of a blind eye, you have a blind ear towards that calling. And you keep on and you keep on pursuing what you're enjoying. You are pursuing intensely what is bringing you happiness at that moment. All the while, mama's peeling back a switch, <laughs> you know. Uh, and you ladies, the same thing. I don't know what... Uh, We've been playing ball too, brother. Y'all are playing ball too? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I, I mean, same, same difference. I mean, uh, uh, but we can, we can understand that. We can sort of all relate to that. And then there was probably some phrase that your mom, each of your moms had, that when you heard it, you were like, uh oh. <laughs> like maybe your full name yelled out, or some explicit you know, <laughs> yeah, that that you know that switch going back and forth would probably be enough. You know, even if you're calling it audible, you can hear that in the background. Oh, guys, I gotta go. There's your audible right there. <laughs> I'm out. That's what that is. What's taking place with James right here? He's like, look, guys. I know y'all are hyper focused on doing what brings you momentary pleasure right now, but you need to listen to what I've got to say, and that's uh, that's what we've got gathered here. Let's go back uh, and read that real quick in 13 through 17. It says, "Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life?" It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. And he just rolls right on, like we just read to start with, about the rich and their labors to maintain their wealth. So we have this, this relationship between these two sets of verses here. And they're related, like I said, in two ways. The pursuit of obtaining wealth, which would be what we read in 13 through 17 of chapter 4. And then the devotion relegated to maintaining that wealth in the first six verses of chapter 5. There's a problem with that. Let me, let me say first and foremost, there is nothing at all wrong with being wealthy. That is not in and of itself a sin. Let me just throw that out there. However, how you obtain that wealth and what you do with that wealth is most important Amen. before God. So we need to rem remember those things. But both of these endeavors, as we spoke about it here, neglect God in two different ways. Those that in verses 13 through 17, those, those are driven to pursue wealth have determined that their lives and decisions along the ways are theirs alone, leaving God out of those choices. That being in the pursuit of becoming wealthy. And then here in the first six verses of chapter 5, those consumed with the attempt to sustain their amassed wealth have hardened their hearts to God altogether, allowing them to take actions that harm their fellow man in the process. Neither one of these these options that James is pointing out are God honoring. 
And it's so easy in this day and age to start out with an idea, a design in your mind to say, let's just take a trip. We plan a vacation. And we say, you know what? We're, we'd like to do this, 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 and this during that trip. And this, 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 and this is going to cost to change, to change, to change, to change. And you're like, well, I need to pick up a, another shift at work. Or we need to cut our expenses for the next few weeks to be able to obtain this. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But for some, they can pick that up and run with it in a different way. They can neglect some payment that they needed to make, some debt that they owed. And it happens. Or given to God. Or given to God. Mm -hmm. That's usually what happens. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You're right. We can turn that really quickly because of what our heart is desiring and so we have to be very careful in our decisions uh, to bring God into them all that's part of our discussion last week one of the things we need to see here in chapter 5 is how James alters the way he's speaking to his readers in this letter and he picks up and adopts the, the speech the verbiage of the Old Testament prophets that railed against the wealthy. And you see those examples in Hosea, in Amos, Micah, Joel, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, especially in those where those particular prophets of God were making a very clear distinction between those of wealth and those without. And he does the same thing the way he speaks right here. And we'll pick up on more of that here in a minute. The other thing we need to understand as we pick this up, and we've we've had to bring it to our remembrance from time to time, who this letter is being written to. And we saw that in, in chapter 1, verse 1, where it talks about the 12 tribes scattered abroad. Again, just to bring to your recollection, these are initially people who served Yahweh through Judaism and now have given themselves over to Christ Jesus as the Messiah and now are serving Him. Now, what we need to understand about the first century context here is how that socioeconomic design worked at that point in time. There was no middle class. You know, you either I don't know what we would put now you either had a Cadillac Escalade or you had shoe leather. There wasn't a Buick in between, you know, or whatever whatever the case is. There was no middle class. You had either more than enough or you had just what would get you through the day. We can't hardly comprehend that nowadays. We are, the, our nation has the richest poor in all the world. I think I told y'all before, you know, I had the distinct privilege to go to Ethiopia. And while we were studying and preparing preparing for that trip, you know, you get to learn some of the backgrounds, uh, some of the do's and do nots, and some of the, uh, the details to be, be help you train your mind in order to approach that particular people group. Literally, a household of four mother, father, two children lived on $150 a year. The equivalent to $150 American dollars a year. That was 20 years ago. Let that sink in. Even do the math and break that down to what that means for your income per day. With. I watched gentlemen in an alley there one time and they had this distinct ability that uh, fat people like myself can't do. You know, this whole squat down and work, you know, like in a deep squat, you know. One of those that 
you just have to come by and shoot me in the head because I wouldn't be able to get up and recover from it from squatting down like that. But they they worked like that and they would have this piece of stone. And I, how they moved that piece of stone, I do not know. But it would be dropped in that alley and then they took this tool that sort of looked like a cross between uh, a ruler, a wooden rule, and then what do you call this thing? Like a compass maybe that has points off the side? And they would take that stone, they would break it down into these manageable pieces, and they would take that rule, gave them the length, and those two pieces off the side gave them the width. And they would chip with their tools, making the equivalent of what we would understand as a solid cinder block. And those things were precise. You could build, you could design based on that thing because it was just like a cinder block. It was a certain width, it was a certain height, it was a certain length, and every one of them was pretty much the same. And as we were talking to our translator, you know, like, man, how many of these can they make in a day? And uh, the, the gentleman said, well, they can make probably two a day per man. And I said, well, what is that? You know, relate to, and he told us what that was in their currency, which is called a burr. And of course, we had to sit back and do some ciphering in the dirt and everything else, count the fingers and all that to figure. Basically, breaks down to a quarter. We get a quarter of a block. Now, you remember when your grandfather or somebody else would give you a, 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 a piece of change or whatever, maybe you paper money and said don't spend it all in one place well look with a quarter you ain't got no choice <laughs> but that's the difference that's we cannot relate today what poor truly means and we'll get a woe is me attitude me first and foremost get a woe is me attitude when the week is longer than the check life for the majority. There was a very small minority of what we would call wealthy. And those are comprised of, you know, the, the Roman rulers that have imposed themselves on a certain region of that land. And then they would take local people that were educated, maybe high, high bred, as we would call it, and they would say, you're going to be my underling. So just because of your position to the wealthy, you become wealthy. And then you had the priests and, and different factions like that. And then you may on occasion find an, a very entrepreneurial merchant that made his way uh, and elevated his status to being wealthy. But the rest, the vast majority, were what we call hand-to-mouth poor. What they did for that day, they provided for their family for that day. So when you sit there and you go back and you read the verses leading uh, at that concluded chapter 4 and you see these people talk about spending their time and energy as to making their plans this sort of was a burr in the saddle of the poor they're like look I praise God that I had food to feed my family with. I praise God that we had you know maybe we bought some kindling some firewood to be able to bake the bread in which we ate if we were really high on the hog we had some dried fish. But there was nothing past that day. The only plans you're going to make, if the Lord wills, is to wake up the next day and do it all over again. Totally different than what we understand poor to be today. I can even say, growing up after my parents divorced, or whatever it was they chose to do, not me. That's a whole different story. Uh, there were times, and, and many, that we go through the week, and it would be toast and oatmeal. And either one, whichever one you chose, for weeks on the end. And as you can see, I've done my 
my darndest to make up for it <laughs> since, since I've been able to be on my own. Uh, but even then, we had toast and oatmeal. We had a roof over our head. Because the other class that we haven't delved into yet on, in this, so you had the ultra-rich, you had the poor, you know, hand-to-mouth daily, and then you had the destitute. These normally consisted of widows, maybe those who were um, uh, had leprosy or some other ailment um, that made them an outcast, or uh, even, even children whose parents had passed away. Essentially, you had no network of family or friends or anything else to sustain you. And so your day-to-day -day survival was based on the generosity of those that came by you. And that was it. There wasn't a new deal. I don't, know, I don't think any of us are old enough to remember that in here, but there wasn't a new deal presented. There wasn't uh, Social Security or any kind of government handout. The best you could hope for was that being a good Jew, that the temple and the priests within the temple would give you a handout to sort of bridge the gap in those low times. Well, guess what? They bring it all home. These are Christians. They're no longer welcome at the temple. Everything that in their service to Yahweh and to the temple and all the alms that they brought for the priest to, in hopes that if things go wrong or things go awry in their life and they fall in hard times, that it would be given back to them in some form or fashion. They're cut off from that. They are no longer, the temple is no longer obligated to help those individuals. So, from that standpoint, when you talk about the rich, you can already taste that iron in your mouth. Those teeth just naturally tend to clench. And you don't look favor favorably upon them. Guess what? These rich that James is speaking of, they don't look favorably upon us either. So, we'll unpack this some more now that we got that part out of the way. As a, a reminder, we are talking about, and this letter is being written to believers. I'm going to throw a, here's your trivia question. How's this thing? Since we got trivia coming up with the ladies not long, long from now. James had some brothers. Another one has a letter in the Bible as well. And they're their first names start with the same letter. Do y'all know who the other one is? Yeah. Will you raise your hand? Come on, man. Jude. Jude. There we go. Excellent. Excellent. There's my gold star pupil today. All right. All right. <laughs> love it. Love it. Love it. Jude spoke about these very people in his writing as well, this letter. He called them apostates. And we've got to remember, James, as we are led to believe by the scholars was the first writing of the New Testament. It was the first one written and in circulation. Uh, Jude came after. But Jude said, hey, these people have already crept in amongst you. And you're unaware. When he was writing to the body of believers. James is saying the same thing. He's like, look, I'm going to write this because I know at each church and each town and each you know, area throughout the known world of that time, this is going to be read. And it's going to grab the attention of the poor and it's going to bring their attention to how they've been used by the rich. And he also knew that there were going to be rich people within the church that are not Christians that are going to hear these very same words, and it's a warning to those. Almost like a woe to you. Matter of fact, he's 
He makes it harsher than that as we break this down. As we continue. Matter of fact, he says that right, right off the bat in verse 1 of chapter 5. He says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Well, that's a beautiful how do you do? Notice there's no brethren in the midst of that. He knows. Just in that verse 1, and if you go back to verse 13 in chapter 4, it says, Come now, you who say, you who deem yourselves on par with God to make your own decisions on your own behalf. So he's isolated these two groups that are not believers. And he does not call them brethren. And he's like, I hope I get your attention too. Notice, he's already mentioned these individuals. If you go back to James 1, 9 through 11, he mentions the rich and calls them out then. He does the very same thing in James 2, 5 through 7. So this is, he sort of skipped over them, pointed a finger, said, here they are in and amongst you. But now he's focusing, he's dialing in the microscope to hyper-focus on the rich at this point in time. That's a, hey, listen up. You need to very much to hear this. And then the second thing that we see here is that you rich. Now, this could be taken two different ways. Because there's wealth as far as finances and prosperity. And there's wealth that we as believers have attained that the world, the laws can't understand. In the midst of my poverty, in the midst of my uh, living hand to mouth daily, it's a whole lot easier from that vantage point to lean in on God and to pray that His Holy Spirit would see you through. Then when you are rich, as this world defines it, you're like, oh man, I'm a self-made man. Everything you see here, by the sweat of my brow, by the sweat of other people's brow, in all honesty, I did it all. Where's God in the midst of that? You've totally pushed Him out and closed the door on God when you've got that mentality. I'm not saying that's for everybody, but the vast majority. But that you rich, let me see if I can speak say this without uh, spitting all over the front row here. <clears throat> Plusios. And it's from the base of Plutos. And that basically means wealthy and abounding in material resources. We get our word plutocrat from this. I didn't know what plutocrat even meant until last week. Matter of fact, no, I'm sorry. Monday is when I found out what plutocrat meant. It means those of wealth. Those who have attained a status due to their, their wealth. And then he tells those individuals which were the high ranking folks whether they had an official status or not just because their wealth it set them apart from the rest. He, told, he tells them this is the Old Testament part. Weep and howl. Now you know when you say that if the rich people had turned from how they were going to manipulate these poor people in the congregation to, to sustain their wealth and to maybe get some more on the backs of those others, you might see that one over there. I've watched him. I think he'd be a good yard guy. And I could probably put off paying him. Probably I pay him one out of every three days. This is what these this is the audience James is talking to. And he said, hey, now that I got your attention, you need to weep it now you know the rich can you imagine what they're what they're what they would say <laughs> we even have for what that I got mud on my, I don't know what's some I don't know fancy shoes but I got mud on I'll get one of y'all to clean it up I don't have to 
Yeah, I'm helpful with this, Monica. This word in Greek Ololudzo is apparently an onomatopoeia. Uh, onomatopoeia. Yeah. I'm throwing this out here just to sort of cover the fact that this isn't going as smooth as I would like for it to be. And I'm trying to throw some big stuff out there to make it look like I learned something. <sighs> Don't take that for what it's <laughs> But this onomatopoeia is... The, uh, the naming of a thing or action by imitation of sounds, natural sounds, like the hiss of a snake. You know, hiss, hiss. You know I don't know what Ololudzu means, but I can tell you that since I've become a Christian, there were things when I hit my finger with a hammer on accident <laughs> that I would say out loud, I have converted over to elemental P. <laughs> so when you hear me say that, oh boy, just cuss like a Christian. Uh -huh. <laughs> so you'll know, you'll know what took place. So I want to say maybe that's an audible. I don't know. All right. If you are, if you are impressed by my mental prowess by that, let me throw another one at you. So this word, how, is a hapax logomenon. Right. That means that's just a fancy word for people that got more knowledge and they got sense. For them to say this is the only time in the New Testament when this word is used. Now why they couldn't say that and have to throw this big old I, I don't know if I can say it a second time. Oh y'all got it. But that's what it means. This word, this is the only time throughout the New Testament it's ever used. But remember what I just said. He is modeling this rebuke after the Old Testament prophets, and they used it quite frequently now. Quite frequently. There's, I love, I love Puritans, and I love their writings. There's one named John Trapp. He's an English Puritan Bible commentator that um, lived during the 1600s. His commentary on this right here it says, Better we peer where there are wiping handkerchiefs in the hand of Christ than to, look, than to have your eyes whipped out in hell. Better howl with men than yell with devils. <laughs> like I said, I love fear because they don't cut no corners. You know, it's uh, black and white, just like their clothing. But that's what James is presenting right off the bat. Right off the bat. That howling, that weeping, it comes, at least here on this earth, from knowing how far off we are from God. It's from a repentant, contrite heart, knowing that we have done wrong before God. If you got that part right, if you are approaching God, with the realization that this part of my life and probably many others, Lord, that I know you're going to point out in time, does not please you, does not honor, honor you, does not glorify you, does not expand your kingdom. And I am so wrong. And I give it to you because I can't do away with it on my own. I need Christ. I need the grace and mercy of His blood shed for me. I need his Holy Spirit residing within me to give me the ability and the discernment and the power to overcome. And we have that. As Christians, we have that. But yet we live in this mentality that we're defeated. There is not an opponent that in Christ, as Christians, that we will ever meet, whether it be physical or or any other spiritual that has not already been defeated on our behalf. Yet we walk around, oh shucks, you know, kicking, our, kicking the dirt and that kind of thing. Like, that's not the line, ladies and gentlemen. And more important than that, that's not the hope of a life after.
what we need to see in these following verses, especially two and three, there are three aspects that are that we can glean from this of this hoarding wealth mentality that James is pointing out here. And those three aspects that we see here, and, and we'll we'll get some more of it as we as we continue on the verse six, but they come in the form of hoarded wealth in grain, hoarded wealth in garments, and hoarded wealth in gold and silver. It's a rarity that I throw three G's or something like that. That, that took me a long time, which I don't know that. Grain, garments, gold, and silver. When you're wealthy, as in the wealth described here, it's not in one of those areas. It's in all. And when that wealth is not dispersed in helping your, if they truly were, your brothers and sisters in that congregation of believers, then you would be dispersing it in aid to those fellow believers. But these people are not fellow believers. They are just there to take advantage of the situation and take advantage of the people that are within that congregation. And James is making this very evident in, in as many ways as he can. Each line says, this is you guys that I love, you're my brethren, and this is these guys. I pray these guys get with the program and get with you guys and I can call them brethren. But for right now, I can tell you that's not the case. And both parties be aware. The other thing that we can see as we look, um, continuing verse 4 here, they have this gain, they have this wealth, and they're sitting on it. Let me, let me unpack this part. When you have grain stored up, remember they don't have refrigeration, they don't have silos, so to speak, or any of this other stuff. What happens to grain when it just sits up? It's mold and rots. Rats consume, rats consume it, and everything else. Now, can you imagine how that must break God's heart to say that that rich person didn't go harvest that grain? His people, who are living hand to mouth on a daily basis, are the ones that are managing those crops harvesting that grain, putting it in the storehouses, the whole nine yards without, as we'll see, most of the times even get paid for it, at least on a regular basis. And it sits there and rots. And it is no help to no one. And yet it makes the rich person mad because something that they had spoiled. And then you continue and look at the garments. You know, it talks about moth I'll be honest with you. Maybe because I, I don't wear a lot of cotton and I don't know. But what do all the moths eat? Silk. Silk, okay. And, and cotton and probably what? Wool. Okay, and then probably cashmere. So there's a, there's a handful of, of things there. I don't know if I've ever had anything. First of all, an item of clothing that I looked at enough to see if it had a hole in it or not to begin with. You know, but at the same time, I don't know if I've had anything that's gotten eaten by moths. I remember going to my grandparents and you smell that moth balls. Just a little weird inside quirk. I love that smell. Gross. People are like, man, that's disgusting. I, man, there's something about it. And it may be the emotional tie to my grandparents. I don't know, but I love the smell. Now my wife's going to stuff one in my nose while I'm sleeping. <laughs> the other thing, he talks about, like I said, those garments. When somebody who's wealthy that can look through their closet and say, oh, don't go, that was my favorite, whatever favorite room. And the moths have eaten it. But there's three more stacked beside it. 
And then the poor is like, man, I just, give me the moth. I'll take it. Again, you have something that went to waste that wasn't even being used. And he goes even further to say the same thing about gold and silver. There are items in which these people had fashioned out of these precious metals that they didn't even put to use. And it just sat on the shelf and corroded or tarnished. Whenever that could have been broken down and probably fed the entire congregation on multiple days. And yet it was wasted. It almost gives you a, pers a perspective of their powers. And they're definitely not God on That is the difference. So that's the stipulation I want to make. That this is not wealthy people who are honoring God with their wealth and realizing it's a blessing to them to bless others. These are people that are Advantage seekers who do not care the cost to gain wealth and maintain the wealth. And it's done by unjust means. If we look in verse 4, it says, Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. What we need to know about that, that term, again, is a term that you would see the Old Testament prophets use. <laughs> That is the Lord of hosts that is, is being mentioned here. The Lord of angel armies. Now it's one thing to run to your mom, but my brother Billy, you know, did this or did that, and he goes to tattling to mom. It's a whole different thing when you're crying out and you're hurt and mama becomes aware of it. Then it's not just switches. It's everything she can get. Hands, flip-flops, you know, hair rollers, throwing at you the whole nine yards. But how much more so when God's children who call upon His name are the ones crying out and it reaches His throne. So, when you think of that, you go back to verse 1 of chapter 5. You say, when you talk about weep and how, it makes sense now. You've got to come. And it's more so than you just wait till your daddy gets home. It's way more than that. One of the things we see about unjust gain as we look back in Deuteronomy 24, 14 through 15, says, You shall not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy. Whether one of your brethren or one of the aliens who is in your land within your gates, or, or one of the aliens who is in your land within your gates, each day you shall give him his wages and not let the sun go down on it. For he is poor and has, checked and has set his heart on it, lest he cry out against you to the Lord and its sin be to you. You know, it's funny. You know, you can't remember Scripture, at least I can't, on a regular basis. But whenever Sonic started putting these signs up that says, hey, we're going to pay you at the end of every shift, I immediately thought of this. I'm like, what in the world did that come from? Did I even read that? But it made me think about this. And it made me think, man, Sonic, I wonder if they really, if they realize that they're actually getting back to this Old Testament principle. Right? And, well, and honestly, the New Testament principle. A day's work gets you a day's pay. That day. It allows them to be able to take the bus back home or whatever the case may be. Buy groceries to, uh, to feed their family, to maybe pay one of their bills or something of that nature, and then tomorrow it's a new day. When we also read this, we talk about what we see taking, taking place in our nation right now. This influx. And I love how they call them immigrants. They're illegal. Amen. There's no way around this. 
it is done the wrong way. That's right. However, however, we need to think about the way we approach those individuals. They are children of God. Their creator and our creator are the same. That's difficult for me. That's very difficult for me. I'll be not be forthright with you. We hear about these armed <coughs> gangs from Venezuela taking over these apartment complexes and casting their occupants out on the street at gunpoint. And I'm thinking to myself, what nation determines it's going to prosper when the inmates run the asylum? When someone who is illegally here, as our military would say, of, of military-aged males, have somehow gotten the, the money that's being doled out by our same government to buy, buy weapons that are automatic that we as citizens of the United States can't even purchase, and yet they are using those against the citizens of the United States. How is this possible? And I think I've watched maybe one too many Rambo movies. I'm like, man, i got enough guys I can call right now. We can go over there and take that part and come back. back. <laughs> That's Rambo movie. That's not God's word. <laughs> and thank God for the Holy Spirit. Because this path would be shot up. Got more holes in it like a pin Uh But stop and think about who was making these decisions on our behalf. Is it not these very same people that James is pointing out right here? There was a time when people who were elected to these positions throughout our local, state, and federal government were servants of the people. And now, we're the servants of those people. We may not be picking cotton. We may not be growing grapes or you know picking olives or whatever the case may be like that would be here but it is your sweat by your brow and your hands that is making the money to perpetuate people to make these decisions on our behalf that do not honor God and they do not benefit us throw that out there so true I'm going to tell you something, another thing, since I'm already at it and got chew leather all in my mouth right now. <laughs> the people who would tell you that the pulpit is not meant to talk politics are lying to you. The pulpits throughout time have been the very place in which right has been established right and wrong has been established wrong. And I don't care if it's they got an R behind their name or a D or an I or whatever. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. They do not set that bar. God does. Amen. Amen. Correct. Correct. Jeremiah 22, 13 also adds to this. It says, Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by injustice who uses his neighbor's service without wages and gives him nothing for his work. How many people in here get paid weekly? Or bi-weekly? I get paid bi -weekly. Okay. Do you know even that element is being talked about right here? You're not getting paid for your day's wages for that day. <clears throat> And you know how this all spawned? Part of that great new deal was that, hey, if our dollars and cents are secure by the, the government in these banking institutions, then if we stretch out the amount of money that we have in there and pay weekly or bi-weekly, then it's drawing us interest in the meantime. Little nuances like that we don't think about. Now, I will be honest with you. I don't know if I want to go to the bank every day. But 
that tells you the difference between what we call poor and what they call poor. Mm -hmm. They'd be like, bank? Half a mile? No problem. Hey. You know. So think about that as we read this, how this aligns with where we are as a nation right now. And here we are in verse 5. You have lived out, you've lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Again, this is almost word for word and the, with those Old Testament prophets. He's like, look man, you have made yourself right for the slaughter. Mm -hmm. Stop and think about it. Myself included. When we have some semblance of what we would call wealth or whatever, the ability to gain goods, groceries, whatever the case may be, and we gorge ourselves, then you look like this. When worse comes to worse, like that incident I was telling you about going to Colorado or whatever, you think this fat boy is going to be able to run around that part of the, part of the complex shooting and getting shot at? That adrenaline would last about five seconds and I'd be caved out on the floor. <laughs> Probably trying to shoot myself for that matter. <laughs> I'd be so winded. But that's what he's saying here. Hey man, you have made yourself a vulgarity amongst the people. We're over here counting our ribs. And we don't even know if you have ribs. In all honesty, that's what he's that's what he's stating here. And notice in verse 6 as we conclude what the rich have done to the less fortunate. You have condemned. That's what he said way back in, ch in chapter 1 when he said the rich have taken you to court. Don't you remember that? Don't you realize this? You poor people are letting them in because, because you're thinking by your association with the rich that you somehow may get some of their prosperity uh, poured out upon you and you're giving them the, the best places. <coughs> but yet those are the ones that are taking advantage of you. Those are the ones dragging you through court that you can't afford. Mm -hmm. And he goes back and he says, they have condemned, the rich have condemned the poor, and you have no justice. And he says, you have murdered the just, because, hey, if I put this person and I say he owes me a shiny nickel, and they put you in pauper's prison, and you die in that, in that, that environment, you think they care? <coughs> you think that that rich person that puts you in that prison cares? He really probably doesn't even care if he gets the shiny nickel back. But he's taking advantage of his position. He's taking advantage of the courts that are on his side. And he's he knows that you have no way, at least in this life, for justice. At least in that establishment. And notice, he says, he, that being the poor, he doesn't resist you. He can't. Absolutely cannot. They had, um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use modern phraseology back then, they had sort of a, a mobile pawn shop back in the day, you know, that we read about in the Old Testament. If you didn't have the money, Pay the bills. Every house had a grinding stone. You couldn't make it through life without it. It wasn't like you were going to the grocery store and you had 20 kinds of flour or meal or whatever to choose from. You got the grains. You had to separate the wheat from the chaff and you had to take that and put it in your grinding stone to get the product to make those flour cakes. That same grinding mill was also the thing that would crush up your olives to be able to process the oil out of it to keep your lamps burning so you could see, to be able to cook your food with and to make your medicinal poultices with. If you didn't have that grinding mill, you were dead in the water. And that was the main thing that the Bible talks about, them pawning. So if somebody lent you money, you gave them the top of your garden. And then you didn't have any 
way to process your food until you paid that off. Now what happens if it took three days pay to pay that lender off and get your grinding money back? And make that fourth day of work pretty doggone hard, I promise you. But even God, I'll, I'll give this to you as a homework assignment. Go back and read Deuteronomy. Go back and read Leviticus and see God even looked out for those details. He said, look, man, if that's the only way they've got means to survive, you as the lender, take that back to them to get through the day and then pick it up that evening in security. Man, it's, God does not miss a detail. Not a single detail. And for us today, we need to realize we are the wealthy. If we're not wealthy materially, financially, we are most certainly wealthy in the world. His provision, it's just hard to get your mind around. The air we breathe, the freedoms that we are holding on to, the families, this church family, if there was anybody in here, I think we've seen that over time at this church. If someone's in need and they share it with us, that need gets met. And I'm so thankful to be a part of a family like this. So thankful. So next time you're in that woe is me mentality, you're like, oh, the odds are stacked against me and the Lord is just gone. Stop. Stop. Think about it. Be honest about it. You don't realize, just like Miss Patty said, he's not the one to move. It's more than likely. Let's go. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for your permission. Lord, I thank you for being able to stand before your people and somehow feeling ill-prepared in my heart yet, yet God. Your Holy Spirit, as always, fills the gaps. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for allowing me to witness your people that stand or sit here before us and have seen each and every one of them and their reliance upon you stand through thick and through thin. And Lord, I don't even know if they realize it, Lord, but it is just a beacon. It's a clarion call to say that it is by God's mighty right hand that I am here. Lord, thank you for allowing me to witness that. Lord, thank you for allowing me to stand here in that same boldness and courage before your people. Lord, help us to do that very same day in and day out with those that we come into contact with. That our lives would proclaim evil when we don't even say a word. And when may they come to know you as those seeds are being planted. 